Welcome to St. Ansgar Baptist Church, an imperfect church full of imperfect people, but we worship a perfect God. How? Together. That's right. In our series, The Church, what is the church? I love that our, our uh, visual for that is a bunch of people together holding hands because that's what the church is, people coming together. Uh, look in your bulletins today for the announcements. Um, first of all, we are going to have uh, an announcement from Dawn about the decorating meeting today. So she's going to come up and share about decorating for VBS. So the meeting will happen after church today. Anybody is welcome. You didn't have to sign up for like being a VBS decorator or anything else. Just I need ideas because we got to make this um, kind of a fun area for the kids to walk into and just what are some ideas. So that's mainly as ideas and maybe helping me give you ideas to do things for me, to help me. Discipleship. Yes, that's the word. Um, <laughs> another thing is, is, again, I need cardboard. So if you've got big boxes, boxes that are, I'm not saying like cereal size, but I'm talking like, Fridge. that would be an option. <laughs> but any like, anything like if you get a box from like Amazon, hey, that I can make a rock out of it, or I can make a hay bale out of it. So just. What's that? You bet. Yes. yes. Big cardboard, I will take whatever. Um, if you guys don't know where I live, you guys can always drop it off. Um, or you can drop it off here and I can always come and get it. Either which way, I'm just asking again for cardboard because some of my ideas entail that. So thank you. Yeah, so stick around right after the service. And it'll be a great help to get some ideas and brainstorm. And uh, John, I guess you need to go buy a new big boy toy in a box. Because we need a box. So tell Melissa that I told you to do that. Uh, also, we have a new groundskeeper. Um, one of the goals that I have is to begin, continue passing things off to people to allow more of the work to be done by more of the people. Samuel Hershey loves working outside, loves cleaning up yards. And uh, so he is our new groundskeeper. So if you would like to help with mowing during the summer or moving so snow during the winter, go ahead and contact him. Also next week, um, Tim Capon was going to be here speaking in Sunday school and in the morning service. Probably, I don't know for sure, probably about what is a pastor, what is a church member, and what is a deacon? What is, how does God call those, show us that those are? Tim Capon is a faithful friend, a godly man. Uh, he loves our church. He loves the churches of the IARBC, which is the Iowa Association of Regular Baptist Churches. And he is the state rep for our fellowship. So he'll be here with us. Also, last year, the church paid out almost $1,700 or $1,800 for Josiah, Josiah and I to go through an intentional discipleship program called the Leadership Journey. And it has been a journey for sure. But Josiah and I just wanted to take a few minutes this morning to say thank you for paying for us to go there. It was extremely helpful for us. Uh, it grew us as friends and also as brothers in Christ. And so Josiah's going to come first, and he's going to share what was meaningful to him. And then I will share, and uh, then we'll pray and sing. Thank you so much. Uh, I had no idea it was that expensive. Uh <laughs> Pastor just mentioned it last week, and I was like, oh my goodness, I couldn't believe it. Um, but thank you so much for sending me on the leadership journey. Um, so we went to a weekend kickoff retreat at IRBC, um, and they basically shoved as much information down our throats as they possibly could in one weekend. And it was really exciting yeah. because you learn, I learned a lot of things about uh, they kind of, they gave, give categories for here is an area that you can you can brainstorm and, and come up with things to help your church grow in intentional areas, um, which I'd never done before. I'd never sat down. I'd, I wasn't a pastoral major in college. I was a missions major, so I missed the stuff where they sit down and they brainstorm on how, you know, how do we fix maybe a small gap that we have in our church. And so they gave us a, a bunch of information. How do you do that? And we would do... Um, what do you call it, like case study kind of stuff where you figure out, you know, if your church had this problem or not a problem but a, a gap where there's not discipleship or there's not um, people coming to church. Um, like how can you fix that problem or come up with solutions for the problem, stuff like that. Um, so that was the kickoff retreat. And then 
what was supposed to be a 24-week study <laughs> turned into like a, a third-week study. <laughs> um, uh, I had a baby, we, but she had the baby. But, and, <laughs> and we had a baby together. She did all the work, and I was there so, to support her. Um, and so that kind of threw some loops, and Christmas was in there too. Um, but it was really actually a blessing because as we went through the study, one of the books we went through is called The Twelve Disciplines. And so it went through the disciplines of the Christian life. So uh, intaking scripture, um, praying, fasting, different stuff like that. And we would focus on one of those each week um, throughout the 12 weeks that we went through that book. Well, having a longer break during Christmas, you had even more time to be able to process that information and figure out how can I, how can I work this into my own life? Um, which was really the hard part was you, you get busy and you have things going on. It's hard enough to make time even to put the effort in for the course because yeah. it, it takes a lot of time. It takes probably five hours a week <clears throat> to prepare for the, I think it's an hour and 15 minute meeting um, that we had every week. And so that was a lot of work, but to take the time and pour into that. Um, but those little breaks gave time to help figure out how can I realistically accomplish these things in my life. Um, and I'll just say one more thing and then I'll go because I don't want to talk too much. Um, but the biggest thing that Leadership Journey did for me was it helped me figure out in my life where I am able to have a leadership role. So one, for example, would be as a husband, I'm the leader of my family. And so it helped me divide uh, or um, help me categorize in my life where I am a leader, where I should be, and then say, what should I be doing in this area that I'm not in order to be honoring God the way that he desires for my life? Um, that was probably the biggest thing um, Leadership Journey did for me. Um, but Pastor and I met last week. It was the last official meeting. And one of the things that we talked about was uh, how was a, a vine and a trellis vine and trellis analogy and how God provides methods that are the trellis on which the vine of, um, of I'm sorry, Jesus. Uh, yeah, of the, on which the vine of Jesus <laughs> can grow. So like it goes and it, and it ministers to people. Yeah. Um, and leadership journey was a trellis that God could use to grow and to work in my life on. And so thank you guys uh, for that opportunity. It was incredible. Thank you. It was a huge blessing. Uh, the three things that stuck out to me was we started off with a leadership journey kickoff weekend. And there we had to go. And, you know, they, they pour all this time into us. And they said, okay, now go for an hour. And in silence and solitude, study the word of God. It's like, okay. And so we just went and for an hour, sat still under the word of God. And they gave us a couple of devotionals that we could do or we could do something of our own. And we were in James 4 uh, is where I chose to go. And it says, the wisdom that is from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated. But then it says, but the wisdom that is from below. And right there, I realized if you and I are to have wisdom, it's got to come down. I can't force it down. God's got to be the one that gives the wisdom. If I can force the wisdom, it's demonic wisdom. And that was just a great start for me uh, with the leadership journey was I got to be making sure that I'm asking for wisdom. The second huge thing for me was working out a muscle that I did not have strong at. Every week we would get together and say, what are you adoring God for this week? Now, I don't know about you, but that was not a question that I usually got asked. <laughs> and it was so awkward to be like, oh, right, that's a thing. And so right before the meeting, we're like, what am I adoring God for? What am I praising him for? And it just forced my attention every week back to who God is, who God is. How can I celebrate God? How can I praise God? And it's like it took the 30 weeks of looking up to go, the best place for us to start in our walk with God is looking up at him. If we look down at all our problems, all our struggles, um, we just are overwhelmed. And so that was, that was really, really helpful for me. And then the third really helpful thing is they made us sit down and think through um, what is critical to God in the church. What absolutely must be a part of the church? What matters to God in the church? And then how do we move people from an unbeliever outside of the church to a pillar of the church who is someone who has not only multiplied themselves once, but has multiplied themselves, and the person they multiply themselves in is multiplying people? How do you move someone from 
hater of God, to not only lover of God, but discipler of people who makes other disciples. And it was just so helpful to think along those lines and um, really, really critical to my own life. So huge thank you from Josiah and I. Uh, we hope to do it again and encourage other men. But again, I will say to all you men, uh, if we ask you, it is a serious commitment. It is not for the faint of heart. It was five to six hours a week just to be doing this. But it was so good. I mean, so, so awesome. We grew a ton together. And, uh, and you confess sin and you open up and you find out a whole lot about each other, about your strengths, your weaknesses. I mean, we went through everything. Um, but I gained a friend. I gained a, gained a brother. I gained a fellow soldier of Christ. And uh, we're really, really appreciative for you guys sending us there. We would like to honor the seniors um, in the future. I did not get jump right on this, though, and so I will be ordering some gifts for our seniors, and in future weeks, uh, we will give the gift to the seniors of our church, uh, sorry, seniors graduating high school, uh, to be clear. Seniors graduating high school, sorry. Man. We want to honor you as well. Uh, we are so thankful for the seniors in life who are faithful to the church and faithful to love. Just give me a shovel. I'm going to keep going. Uh, <laughs> but as we, as we go to the Word of God, the, the verse that had come to mind to pray for the seniors, I think it's also true for all of us. It's in Proverbs chapter 3. So let's just ask God to bless us as we think about Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Father, you have said in Proverbs, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Father, each one of us here are on a journey. Um, we are on a path, and it is extremely easy for us to trust in ourselves. Thank you that you are a God who is trustworthy, one who is a rock and a fortress, our God in whom we can trust, the one that we can go back to over and over and over and over again with life. And we, we confess that most of the time we want to lean on our own understanding. We want to know exactly what's going to happen tomorrow. We want to know what's going to happen with our job, with our family, with our church. We want to know what's going to happen when we open your word, if we're going to read it and be changed by it and, and have an awesome experience in it. We want to know exactly what's going to happen in the future. Um, and we lean on our understanding to try to control that. But God, we don't know. But you do. So we worship you as the God of all knowledge and also the God of all wisdom to guide our paths. And we humble ourselves to say, not our will, but yours be done. And so even today, God, I pray that you would be obviously in control of this morning's service, that you would guide us in our singing, that you would guide us in scripture, mem uh, scripture reading, and that you would guide us in, by our spirits as we, as we submit to you, guide the message to bring glory to you. And I pray for each person here in their journey. Maybe there's something ahead of them that they're really struggling with, that they want to depend on their own understanding. We just collectively cast our burdens upon you, knowing that you care for us. And I pray that in these songs, you would lift up our eyes to who Jesus is and the fact that we can trust him and that we can go forth with confidence because the God of the past is the God of the future. And we know that he is good. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Raise your hand if you've ever had a difficult week. <laughs> Thank you, Denny. <laughs> Raise your hands. <laughs> Raise your hand if you've ever had a difficult week. Probably all the hands should go up. I won't, you don't have to raise your hand for this one. How many of you had a difficult week this week? Probably a lot of us. Statistically, a lot of people have hard weeks even every week. And so I just want to read to you the first verse of this song before we sing it. My heart can sing when I pause to remember that a heartache here is but a stepping stone. A stepping stone along a trail that's winding always upward. This trouble world, troubled world is not my heart, my final home. But until then, my heart will go on singing. So stand with me and sing. Um, we have hope. We have hope because this world is not our home. That's not the song we're singing. We're singing until then. Until then. <laughs> My heart can sing when I pause to remember a heartache here is 
but a stepping stone along a trail that's winding always upward. This troubled world is not my final home, but until then, my heart will go on singing. Until then, with joy I'll carry on. Until the day my eyes behold the city. Until the day God calls me home. This weary world with all its toil and struggle may take its toll of misery and strife. The soul of man is like a waiting falcon when it's released it's destined for the skies but until then my heart will go on singing until then with joy i'll carry on until the day my eyes behold the city until the day God calls me home. The things of earth will dim and lose their value if we recall they're borrowed for a while. And things of earth that cause our hearts to tremble remembered there will only bring a smile but until then my heart will go on singing until then with joy i'll carry on until the day my eyes behold the city until the day god calls me Great singing. Praise the Lord. We're going to sing The Savior is Waiting next. When we get to that home, it's not just going to be an empty place right. with really shiny streets. It's going to be the place where Jesus is, mm -hmm. and we get to spend eternity with him, worshiping him. And that's what makes those heartaches and those difficult weeks worth it all. The Savior is Waiting. step forward the Savior my friend you'll find his arms open wide receive him and all of your darkness will end within your heart he'll abide time after time he has waited before and now he is waiting again to see if you're willing open the door oh how he wants to come in great
great singing. We're going to go ahead and have a seat, and we'll have the men for the offering come forward, please. Mark, would you pray for us? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this gathering today. Father, it's a, it's a call out for your honor and glory. And it's your body. Mm -hmm. Father, it's not an organization. And it breathes your life, your spirit in us. We thank you that you purchased the church. It was your design from eternity that you would bring sons and daughters. Even before this planet was made, you, it was your plan to bring them to share glory. Your glory with us. That's so you don't understand and thank you for your grace that you would save and even die for the church. And Father, we thank you that someday we'll be reunited with you. Mm -hmm. It'll be a celebration, Father, when you come to receive your bride. But Father, in the meantime, I pray that the church would take its mission seriously, that we would see people less lost, and only your word, your word, the good news of the gospel could save them. So help us to be faithful till we see you. Thank you for the time we can share just a little bit, every little bit that what you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.
There we go. Uh, if you follow along in the chair Bible ahead of you, it's page 959, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, our text for today. The Word of God says this, it says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I don't want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking controlled by the Spirit of God ever says that Jesus is accursed. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the power of the Holy Spirit of God in him. Verse 4, now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are a variety of activities, but it is the same God who empowers all of them in everyone. To each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gift of healings by one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Verse 12 says this, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. Verse 15 says, If the foot should say, Because I'm not the hand, I don't belong to the body. Can you imagine if your foot could talk? <laughs> That'd be a weird conversation. You're right. That would not make it any less a part of the body. Verse 16, And if the ear should say, Because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, that'd be weird too, wouldn't it, Chase? Yeah, it would. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God has arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And on our unrepresentable parts, we treat with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body but that the members might have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, we all suffer together. If one member is honored, we all rejoice together. Now, you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. And God has appointed to the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles... Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? The implication is no. Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? No. Do all interpret? No. But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. And may God help us to pursue that more excellent way. Let's go ahead and stand, and we'll continue singing together. Then we sang the song, The Savior is Waiting. Then Bonnie played, I Can Only Imagine. And now we're going to sing as almost through the music service, we've come to the throne of God. And we're going to sing before the throne of God above. Sing with me. <clears throat> the 
Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart, I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can bid me thence depart. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me, to look on him and pardon me. Behold him there, the risen Lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with himself I cannot die, my soul is purchased by his blood, my life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. Great singing. <laughs> and <laughs> so we've come to the throne, gro throne room. We've praised God because he's sitting there in his throne over all creation, sovereign over everything. And so now we're going to sing, In God We Trust and In Him Alone. And don't forget the second and third verse, we'll sing back to back and then the chorus. <clears throat> We pray for peace and plead for grace. We bow our knees in humbleness. We cry to God to heal our land, forgive our sins and cleanse our hands. In God we trust, in God alone, we put our faith in him who sits on heaven's throne. Though men of earth will rise and fall, our only hope is in the Lord of all. In God we trust, in God alone. Oh, let us rest in God's control and honor those he put in Power. For hearts of kings are in his hand. The nations turn at his command. Protect the weak, establish law. Honor the right, punish the wrong. Let this be true of those who lead, O oh, men of faith. Now intercede, in God we trust, in God alone, we put our faith in him who sits on heaven's throne, though men of earth will rise and fall, our only hope is in the Lord of all, in God we trust, in God alone. If persecution soon will come, help me to stand, if all alone. And though my life he may call forth, God's kingdom is not of this earth. In God we trust, in God alone, we put our faith him who sits on heaven's throne, though men of earth will rise and fall, our only hope is in the Lord of all, in God we trust, in God alone. Thank you. You may be
be seated. You can dismiss the kids for Children's Church. Pull that back up. Right, but yeah, right before we start our service, let's just go to God. Um, you know, people that need the Lord, and it could be for salvation, or maybe you know someone who's going through something really hard. Let's just lift them up in our minds as Bonnie plays through that one more time. People need the Lord. And show us that you are good and strong and we can trust in you in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Turn with me again to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So we're doing a study of what is the church. The answer is the church is Christ's body. And this is, uh, most of us think in pictures. We are, we're thankful for metaphors. And here's a picture that we have of what the church is. In 1 Corinthians, it develops this the most of what the body of Christ means and what it looks like. You need to understand that Corinth was like the Las Vegas of today. It was unashamedly about amassing wealth. It housed the temple of the goddess Aphrodite. It's where a ten or a thousand temple prostitutes were. And its unwritten billboard over the city was, Come to Corinth and experience your wildest dreams. The city revolved around selfishness. The selfishness got the rich richer by selling an experience to other selfish human beings. Money, sex, and selfishness are the three stooges of meaning in life. And that's what they lived for. Into this environment, the glory of the simple gospel came. Uh, they loved eloquence. And Paul came, and you know what he said? He said, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was raised according to the Scriptures. And he gives us new life according to the Scriptures. And there were many who were saved. And they started a church. Our definition of the church is God's people called out of death, coming together to accomplish God's plan on earth. And the Corinthian people had been called out of the world, but they still struggled a ton with selfishness. And when it came to serving in the church, everyone wanted the best part of life. They wanted the best part of the this, this services that brought attention to themselves. And so Paul writes to correct this thinking. Point number one, God energizes the body. He wanted to remind them that it is God who energizes the body. In our text, verses 1 through 11, he says, Concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I don't want you to be uninformed. And then jump down to verse 6. It says, There are a variety of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. If you look down at verse 11, it says, All of these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Just the other day, I was reading a book that told this, and you have these on the screen for you. In 2012, a Barna group conducted a survey about the effect that people, the church had on people. 46% of people reported zero change during their lifetime due to going to church. 46% of people. Can you imagine if 50% of the people here, 46% of the people, one out of two, said, I have never been changed by going to church. 46% said that. 61% reported no significant insight or understanding received from their last three visits. Nothing new that they had learned, no aspect of God that they had learned to adore better, nothing in their last three visits. 33% said they had never felt God's presence while in a congregational setting. The author of the book concluded this. He said, when leaders la sense a lack of vibrancy in their weekly gatherings, they dismiss the old paths of the word of God in prayer and they turn to new techniques. In doing so, they risk not only subjugating the power of the Holy Spirit, but reducing the worship experience to a presentation that fails in many ways to accomplish the goal of bringing glory to God. The Corinthian church had begun to chase an experience. And Paul said, you need to understand that the church is empowered. It is energized by God. That Greek word for energize, you know what it is? Energios. Energios. Does that sound familiar to any words we know? Well, of course. I put it, that's why I put energize in there. It literally means to give energy to. And he says that God is the one who gives inner energy the Corinthian church, they had, per, they had chased personal experiences, and it was killing them. And that's a temptation for every church and for every person you meet. Consider the culture with me. In our town, we have people making more money than before, living in bigger houses, driving newer cars, yet they're cheating more often on their spouses, they're lying on their taxes, they're doing drugs, they're pursuing drunkenness, death-scrolling social media, and they're depressed. Why? Because there's no energy behind those things. All these things seem to offer life. They seem to offer satisfaction. They seem to offer meaning. But there's no energy behind it. 
We were talking in Sunday school about the importance of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. There's only one thing that provides true meaning. And that is serving God for his glory. If you were to narrow down the meaning of life, I would put it this way. The meaning of life is to glorify God by being empowered by him to do his will and serve others. Let me tell you where I get that. Empowered by God, verse 6 says, there are a variety of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all and everyone. Okay, so my job, it says, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to what? The glory of God. Okay, so I'm supposed to do everything to the glory of God. How do I do everything to the glory of God as a sinner? Well, I have to be empowered by God to do it. But does that mean that I just sit in a, in a little cocoon and I'm constantly praising God? No. What does he say in verse 7? To each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. I want to ask you a question. Are your neighbors glad that you're a Christian? Is there an evidence of Christ in you empowering you to do good for others? Is that evidenced? Do they see that? How do your neighbors view? You see, it doesn't just stop with honoring God. It also moves into honoring others. My dad used to always say, joy comes from Jesus, others, you. When our attention is Jesus first, others second, and then ourselves. Energio, God energizes the gift. Jesus is the head giving commands to the body. And as you think about a body, what is it that gives something life? It was a few years ago, but Dalton Cottrell was a promising young pastoral student at Faith Baptist Bible College. Three days into his honeymoon, he died in a tragic accident. At his viewing, his wife would not look at him in the casket. When I did, I understood why. I've been to many funerals of many older people, and oftentimes, uh, the undertaker makes them look very good. Um, one of the sayings often that I hear at a funeral is, he looks like himself. But not Dalton. I went up to the casket, and it was almost terrifying. It looked like there was a 70-year-old in the casket. Why? There was no life. All the cosmetics had been put on. He was dressed in nice clothes. His hands were all there, but he was lifeless. Churches cannot thrive without the energy of God working in us. We can put on all the cosmetics. It's not going to change anything. We can have all the right parts. It's not going to change anything. We've got to have energy. Right? You've got to have something that moves your hands, something that moves your feet, something that moves you, that moves your mouth. It's not just about the body. You've got to have life flowing through the body. And God is the one who gives the life. God is like the heart. If you're to go with the body image, God is like the heart, and he pumps the blood of the Holy Spirit into each member. And Jesus Christ is the head, and he's giving commands. He's saying, you work in here, and you serve in this way, and you glorify me in this way. And in fact, if you notice in our text, it says there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. That's God, the Holy Spirit. There are a variety of service, but the same Lord. That's Jesus Christ, God the Son. There are a variety of activities, but it's the same God, God the Father, who empowers them all in each one. God is the one who energizes the body. Point number two, God equips the body. Verses 12 through 31 he goes on and says, just as one body, the body is one, has many members, all the members of the body, though many, are one body. So it is with Christ. And Paul reminded the Corinthians that it was God who had arranged them. Verse 18 said, God arranged the members. Verse 24 said, God composed the body. Verse 28 says, God appointed this. Why? Why? Because of verse 25. Why does God arrange us like this? That there may be no division in the body but that the members may have the same care for one another. Why has God made us different, but also given us each value? So we care for each other. Do you know you should be cared for in the church? And you should care for others in the church. And the world is longing for that. They're looking for that. 
In fact, one is mentioned ten times in these verses. Paul urges us to learn three lessons from this text. Letter A, your gifts are not accidental. Understand that your gifts are not accidental. Okay? God didn't mess up when he gave you the gifts that he gave you. He didn't say, whoops, I kind of forgot this one. I should have given them a few more gifts. Do you remember when the master, he goes to leave his servant, and he leaves one servant with five talents, one servant with two talents, and one servant with one? You know why? Because he knew the servants. <laughs> and he said, the one talent guy is going to go bury five talents, so I might as well just give him one. And he gives us an opportunity. And he's given us different gifts. And the Corinthians, they wanted anything that put them on the stage. They wanted anything. They wanted to speak in tongues. They were all excited about that because part of the pagan worship was to interact with the demons in such a way that you had this emotional experience of, of this supernatural emotional experience. And so they're like, I really liked that feeling that I got. So th I get that feeling when I speak in tongues. I want to speak in tongues. And even today in Pentecostalism, there's a push to speak in tongues. But listen, even today, many want to preach, teach Sunday school, be a deacon, or hold an important position. Because the danger that we all face is the comparison trap. And this will have two effects on you. Did you notice the two effects of comparing yourselves with others? Do you notice that in this text? One is, well, because I'm not a deacon, I don't matter. One comparison is to look at others and say, I have no use in this church. So-and-so is doing this. They are serving in this way. They have, they have this much joy. I still remember, um, especially when it comes to speakers, you know, when you're in college, you, you go to college and all my college students understand this. You, you go to chapel every day in college, okay? So like sermons every single day. And after you go to so many sermons, you start comparing the speakers. You just do. Like, there's no sense lying about it. You just do. And there will be one guy who gets up and he's like, dude, <laughs> preaching's not your gift. Just uh, move on with life. Especially when you're in a class about homiletics. I was in a class about homiletics one time, which is the art of preaching. And we each had to give a sermon. And this one guy got up there and... Uh, he was scared out of his mind. And he just sit here and like grab the pulpit and his knuckles turned white. And the entire time as he was preaching, um, you know when someone's embarrassed, like they turn red? Like he legit went from my skin tone to bright red. But it just like crept up his neck like really, really slowly the entire time he preached. You know, it's just like, it's probably not your thing, man. <laughs> Does that mean he matters less to the body of Christ? Absolutely not. Do you know what? There's a guy that I went to college with, and he was what I would have considered one of the most ungodly men at college. He got so many, he got in trouble so many times with the deans. He literally paid hundreds of dollars at the end of the semester because he got in trouble so often. They'd be watching movies, like they'd start movies at 1 o'clock at night. You're not supposed to watch movies in your room. All of them were not right. They weren't supposed to watch any of these movies. And I judged him like crazy today. He is faithfully serving the Lord in a church. He's working hard, took over his dad's business, is a generous giver in the church, loves the Lord, is serving him faithfully, and goes out of his way to honor God. And there are other guys that I went to. I took preaching classes with them. And they don't even believe in God anymore. And I remember one girl that I was in college, and she had all of her life together, it seemed, Today, she's an atheist. God arranged the body to help us realize that your gifts are not accidental. And on that note, one of the things God's convicted me of is, you remember that old saying, loose lips sink ships? One of the often, the characteristics that I've struggled with is loose lips. And last week, um, I used the illustration to compare, talk about people that hold the church back. And it was fundamentally flawed, and the Holy Spirit convicted me. In this set, it's, look at verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. As your pastor, I cannot say to any of you, I have no need of you. And what I did when I compared people to, um, like, sticks in the mud that hold the church back was basically encouraging you to view some people as having no need of them. And that was wrong. I'd like you to forgive me because we do need each other. Desperately, because your gifts are not accidental. And it says even in verse 22, look at verse 22, on the contrary, the parts of the body that seem weaker are indispensable. And the parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the great, greater honor. And our unrepresentable parts are treated with greater modesty. 
you know, a part that seems extremely weak and that is extremely weak in your body is your eye. And my family can tell you, try to touch my eye and you will not succeed. <laughs> I have instant reflexes to protect my eye. I hate anything coming close to my eye. Why? It's a weaker part, but you treat it more carefully. And God says, you know, that part that is so weak is actually essential. And she might hate me for doing this, but I think there's an essential member in this church that maybe some of you don't even know about, and that the health of this church is directly tied to her, and it's Janet Yanger who has prayed for me and my family. She's prayed for you and your family over and over and over again. And you may not know her, but she prays for you, and she sends you thank you cards and birthday cards, and she loves you deeply, and she loves us deeply. And um, there have been many times in my life where I've thought, <laughs> Janet! <laughs> She's praying for me again because God just doesn't let me live um, resisting him because of her faithfulness. And Janet, I thank you. Thank you for your service. You are not accidental. And uh, one of the sad things for me as a pastor is often as members get older, they think, I remember when I used to teach Sunday school. I remember when I used to make it to all the services. I remember when I used to this. I remember when I used to bring the food to carry and dinner. I remember when I used to. And they begin to think that they don't matter anymore. And that's wrong. Maybe the baton is passed, but the work is not done. And we need each other, even the parts that we think are weaker. And so Paul says, listen, we all need each other, and your gifts are arranged. They're not accidental. Letter B, your gifts are dependent and not independent. The Greek word here is, he says, so that there may be no division among the body, that no rivalry would happen, that there be no schism. It says in uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 through 4, let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but for the interests of others. In the human body, we have 206 bones. We have over 900 ligaments, 60,000 miles of blood vessels, 30 trillion cells. And we all need each other. The body is not individual, individuals by themselves. It's individuals working together. And in fact, if you've ever driven by someone's yard who's a junker, um, he may have a ton of engines. But what's, why do cars not run? Because the parts aren't working together, right? Why do churches not run? Because the parts aren't working together. We're, uh, who we just went through leadership journey with, that one of their jobs is to go into churches that are dying and help them get life. And one of the first things they do is they say, you're on each other's team. This is a team where we work together for the glory of God. We need each other. Because it says, when one member suffers, we all suffer together. Now, I may be more accident prone than some of you are, I know I am, <laughs> um, but I remember being back in college, and uh, I was playing basketball, which was a bad life choice, but anyway, playing basketball, I go up for a layup, I come back down, and I land on a guy's foot, and my kneecap goes from here to right here, which is not fun. Um, if you've ever had that happen, I've had it happen hundreds of times, but it's not fun. And uh, so I went down, it had been a year or so, and I was just in pain. Guess what? I ended up getting crutches. What happens with crutches? The rest of the body helps the weaker part. Do you know how cool it is when one member in the church is hurting and the rest of the body just comes together and says, let me help you. Let me strengthen you. And then you know what happens? It says, when one member rejoices, we all rejoice. You know, I've also broken a few bones and, uh, you cut off the cast and you finally get to walk and your whole body's excited. <laughs> like, finally, you get to walk again. And so we're dependent. We are not independent. And let her see the purpose of the gifts is to benefit the body. The apostles, the prophets, the teachers, they're exalted above speaking in tongues. But the purpose of our gifts is to benefit the body. John Piper says this, God did not design Christians to be strong in faith and fervent in worship without other Christian 
ministers strengthening their souls. He, Paul, does not see the Christian dependence on other Christians as a defect in our dependence on God. If you find someone who says, hey, I am a strong Christian, but I just don't care for Christ's church, they're wrong. You cannot be a strong Christian without Christ's church. Just take it like this. I mean, okay, let's go with the, body, the image of the body. Let's say they're the finger. Cut off your finger, set it on the table. How strong is it? It's not strong. But many people today, they cut themselves off from the church and they expect strength. No. There's damage that happens. There. It says in 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as the one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves in the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Tim be dominion and glory forever and ever. Amen. So point number one, God energizes the body. Point number two, God equips the body. Point number three, God enlivens the body. Chapter verse, verse uh, 31 says, Earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a more excellent way. Look at me with, at 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak with the tongue of men and angels, and I don't have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Curious, how many of you played the gong or cymbal in high school? Anyone? I have never heard of parents who are like, I love that my kid decided to play the cymbals. He says, if you speak in tongues, but you don't love, you are annoying. And if I have prophetic powers, I understand all mysteries, all knowledge. If I have all faith to move mountains, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give all that I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but I don't have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. And kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And he says the better way is for love. We're leaving for a vacation this week, and there is a faster way to get to vacation, but it is not a better way. The faster way is is just like in the Cars movie, you know, the faster way is right through all the scenery. <laughs> you just blow right by it. But we like to take the scenic route. Not super scenic, because I like to get there fast too. But uh, scenic enough where we go by lakes, we get to enjoy the trees. It's a better way, do you know? It is a better way when we love each other and serve one another. Listen, today our world is craving genuine community. We have the LGBTQIAA plus community. They're making it into commercials. They're marching into the streets. But what they're looking for won't be found even if the whole world accepts them. Because what every human being needs is not acceptance. It's love. And it says God is love. Not acceptance is love. God is love. And people are looking to be loved. We all want to be expect, accepted, but above that, we need to be loved. AI, do we have a picture here? I believe her name is Sophie or Sophia. Um, she is an AI human, they call her. And recently I saw two videos where she was a part of the video with Arak was one of them. And it was a dating show with her, and they had all these guys come, and she tried to date them. She had all the facts, but she had no life. She's incapable of love. And AI is incapable of love. That's the reality. And even as I watched the show, there was one guy who said uh, he, did, he lived 100 hours only controlled by whatever AI told him to do. And in the morning, he woke up and said, what should I do? And I think it was chat D GTP. What should I do? He said, drink a glass of water. And so he drank a glass of water. Now what should I do? Go for a bike ride. And he became very, very healthy. But then he went on a date. And he waited for the AI to give him advice. And guess what? The date left. Because the AI doesn't understand love. And there are many, many people in our world who are looking for love in all the wrong places. And I challenge you, it says in 1 Peter 4, 7 through 9, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. I want to encourage you to be loving. Jesus is beautiful in this text and we can adore the heart of our loving head who desires unity among our members.
because he desires that we love one another. And I want to ask you the question, do you love others? Do you love your neighbors? Do you love the people that come here? And do you think that you can just work that up? Or do we have a better idea to say, you know what? God is love. Why didn't you give me some of that? Because some people are hard to love. So let's go out and follow the better way of loving others. Yesterday, Dude Perfect released a video where they broke the new highest trick shot ever. Over 800 feet, they made an 800-foot basketball shot. Which, if you know anything about shooting from that far, the wind affects it a ton. When it finally happened, they thought it was never going to happen. When it finally happened, everyone celebrated and they were really excited. And then in the end of the video, they said, you know what? You may think this is ridiculously silly. A bunch of guys in their 20s, 30s, and 40s shooting basketballs. <laughs> like, what in the world is about that? But it says, it is more than trick shots. We're a family. And that's what matters. Even in that level, they say, what really matters is not that they have all the money that they got from YouTube, or from YouTube which is a lot. It's not that they're breaking world records. They literally have the Guinness Book of World Records on several things. It's that they're loved. They belong somewhere where they're loved. People should feel loved here. And may God help us to love them. So here's some application questions for you. Since God energizes your gifts, will you praise him and pray for more power? If each member is important, how does your view of people in the church need to change? And this was a one for me. Have you ever experienced an unkind waiter or waitress? Anyone ever experienced an unkind waiter or waitress? You ever gone through that? Now answer this question. How did that sit with you? Were you like, hey, I'd love to give a big tip to this person. You're like, this, you have one job <laughs> to be a waiter or a waitress. How did that sit with you? Now think about this. Evaluate how you serve. Are you serving with love? Because that waiter or waitress might have been doing everything they needed to. They brought you their food. They brought you your water. They brought you everything. They were there. They cleaned the table, but with no joy. How do you serve? And are you hurting or rejoicing? With whom do you need to share that? We're the body of Christ. And then what is there that you can worship or praise God for in this text? Father, I thank you that you show us a greater way, which is love. Empower us to love one another with a pure heart fervently for your honor and for others' good. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and stand, and we will close together in the song, Turn Your Eye. O soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There is light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Sing with me. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. <clears throat> soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Through death into life everlasting, he passed and we follow him there over us nor has dominion for more than conquerors we are turn your eyes upon jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace his word shall not fail you he promised believe him and all will be well then go 
to a world that is dying his perfect salvation to tell turn your eyes upon Jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace sing the chorus with me one more time a cappella turn your eyes upon jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace grace singing you are dismissed mm -hmm.